So thank you for your patience while we had a, a, a quick technology change. So uh, I've been uh, asked to give the second of the plenary sessions uh, this morning. So I've chosen as uh, the title, uh, The Needs of Stakeholders uh, in the RDM Process. I'm going to uh, try and look at this as LEARN starts its work in identifying what these needs are and how we might address them, what the role of LEARN is and the role that LEARN can play in this uh, research data space. Uh, and I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, a number of issues, some of which Geoffrey has uh, alluded to, uh, some of which uh, I may be able to expand on uh, a little bit more, uh, to continue to set the context for uh, the research data discussions that are ongoing and that I hope will be reflected in the workshop discussions that you have uh, this afternoon, where we are very, very keen to hear what you've got to say about technical and non-technical issues around the research data space. So I'm going to set the scene by looking at the Leru roadmap, which is the starting point for uh, the uh, toolkit and the model research data management policy that LEARN will be uh, producing. Uh, I'll then say a little bit uh, more about uh, Open Science, the Science 2.0 uh, agenda that Jeffrey's been spoken so eloquently about in the first session, and then pick maybe one or two exemplar issues which uh, are part of the forest of issues which concern uh, uh, research data uh, and, and which uh, LEARN has been uh, taking an active part in. So one would be what would be the role of the research funding agency in uh, uh, the research data space. And uh, I, I do this following a, a, a workshop that I and uh, 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 Professor Leonelli uh, attended in Bern in Switzerland at the end of last year, where we were asked this very question. We were asked to tell Swiss funding agencies or advise the Swiss funding agencies what their role was. So I came up with some interesting ideas. I thought they were interesting. I don't know if the funders thought they were interesting, but I'm happy to share those with you. I want to say a bit more about text and data mining, because I think that is a really major issue which the Commission is be, uh, dealing with at the moment through a policy intervention. And then uh, looking at Jeffrey's um, picture of the iceberg for national infrastructure, try and set that in the context of the European Open Science Cloud, because I'm a member of the high-level expert group on the European Science uh, Cloud, and we're just about to issue our report. So maybe I could, without revealing what the report says, because I'm not allowed to say what the report says, I'm afraid it's under embargo, and I, I'll lose all my rights and um, um, liberties with the Commission if I uh, reveal it. But I'll try to do a reality check on what uh, I think the report may or may not say about certain issues against Jeffrey's um, uh, uh, glacier, um, iceberg um, uh, 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 um, diagram then try and bring some sort of conclusion. So the, the starting point for the LEARN project is the LERU roadmap, the roadmap for research data that was produced by uh, the League of European Research Universities. I know it was LERU that, that, that produced it. it, it so LERU is a, is, a, is a grouping of 21 research uh, universities, many of whom are present, certainly the UK members are present in the in, in the room, and indeed um, uh, colleagues from the continent of Europe as, uh, uh, as well. We, um, there we have colleagues from Barcelona and uh, uh, Leuven here as, uh, as well. But the recommendations that the roadmap uh, made, I think, I think 41 recommendations uh, aimed at a number of stakeholder groups. The, these are generic recommendations that apply to any research funder, to any research organization, to any scientific body or, society, or learned society, they're not, they're not unique to uh, LERU. Although it, so what is unique is that LERU was the first body, university body, actually to start grappling with the implications for research data management to try and apply them in a practical context. The, re the recommendations are not unique to LERU. They apply to all of us, I think practically to everybody in the room, if you were interested to take a look and see uh, what the recommendation was in, in your area of expertise and interest. Uh, I'm not saying this is the way that LEARN will divide up the issues, but certainly when we uh, wrote the LERU roadmap about two years ago, we, we uh, divided the topics into these uh, chapter headings. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but uh, policy and leadership, uh, advocacy, 
um, some technical library kind of um, administrative issues around selection, metadata, curation, uh, uh, description, curation, citation, and legal issues. Uh, we did talk about research data infrastructure, technical infrastructure, with some case studies. Costs, uh, we talked about a little bit. Roles and responsibilities and skills, and then made some uh, recommendations. So uh, when I presented the uh, Leru roadmap to the 21 Leru rectors, uh, which of those topics do you think they thought was most important? Costs, yes. That was the first, yes, everybody says that. And that's the first question that um, uh, the rector said, how much is it going to cost? Uh, and that's quite a challenge, because we don't actually know how much it's going to cost. We, we know we've got some costs for individual parts of the, of the system. We can cost our salaries for advocacy or for curation. We can cost uh, the construction of infrastructure for research data storage, for example. So one of the case studies in the Leru roadmap is from UCL, uh, from my university, where uh, Max Wilkinson, who was then head of research data services, costed for us the, um, the cost of a, a creating a, a, a local storage service. Not an archive service, but a storage service for uh, storing project data, data created by uh, externally funded projects. But of course, the first question that a decision maker, a senior university administrator will ask, well, t don't tell me what you want to do until you tell me how much it's going to cost because then I can tell you whether we can afford it or not. So I'm hoping in the, it, it, so one of the um, um, objectives of the LEARN project is to get some more handle on, no, a greater handle on, on costs and, and concerns that universities or scientific bodies have about elements in the cost and who's going to fund the, the whole uh, infrastructure. It went, uh, LEARN in, it isn't in itself a financial project in the sense that isn't our main objective. But it is such a key uh, question that I don't think the, learn, the toolkit can uh, be produced at the end of the two years without s saying something more about costs or giving some examples of where universities or individual uh, learner societies have, have met uh, res uh, uh, research data costs and what the level of cost is compared to, say, the cost of supporting open access infrastructure uh, for publications. Most universities have reasonably willingly uh, absorb the cost for OA to publications through green open access uh, repositories because the level of costs compared to the overall university budget is actually quite small. But, but that's not necessarily the case for research data management, so we, we that learn, we'll need to say something about costs to give a level of confidence to decision makers that are making decisions they can actually afford. These were the key messages. Um, I, I've talked a lot about costs, but actually the key messages in the Leru roadmap come in another come in another space. Everybody needs a research data management strategy. Uh, when I first surveyed, we surveyed um, with uh, Alia, uh, our policy officer from Leru, who's sitting down here in, in the front row. Uh, uh, we first surveyed the um, Leru 21 Leru universities after we produced the roadmap. Said, well, how many of you got, how many of you have got research data management policies? Uh, the answer is less than half. So funnily enough, everybody was thinking about creating one. So when you said, ah, well, if you haven't got one, how many of you are thinking of creating one? Everybody put their hand up and said, oh, yes, yes, we're thinking very hard about creating one. <laughs> uh, but in fact, then, in, did, uh, when you ask, well, do you actually have one now that, that, that creates a framework for your spending, your, your policy development, your infrastructure development? Uh, less than half of them had... Uh, Policies, which is why uh, a model research data management policy is one of the key deliverables of the LEARN project, because we think that's going to be very useful for universities across the globe, for research organisations, for learning societies, for research funders who want to get involved in this space, that you need to have a policy framework in which to cast your actions and develop your strategy. So that, it's the finding of the LEARN project. Uh, sorry, the uh, finding of the uh, Leru Research Data Roadmap that has led to that as being an explicit deliverable in the LEARN uh, uh, project. Uh, my university is one of the universities in the Leru uh, study that did have uh, a, a research data policy. David Price, who opened the uh, LEARN workshop here today, was in, uh, insistent that we did have one, so he asked me as the uh, head of uh, director of library services and, and chair of the research data executive, the university body that oversees all the 
uh, research data activity in uh, UCL to uh, develop one. Uh, as David uh, said, the, uh, the driver for this, for the creation of the policy, was, well, uh, I, I put three bullets here, uh, external, the, the requirements of external funders, the need to inform researchers, and the need to raise awareness. All those things are true, but um, in fact, the, ma the main driver at the time was, was the first bullet there. Uh, the uh, driver from external funders, where external fund uh, um, policies were ma beginning to make requirements about how you manage your research data, where it's kept, is it available for sharing and reuse, and how long is it kept. And the EPSRC, one of the uh, research councils in the UK, was the first to make explicit requirements uh, for research data uh, on its funded uh, uh, researchers, and that drove, of course, it drove a whole host of uh, activity at university level to make sure that uh, we could comply with uh, the requirements of the funders. But as Geoffrey said in his talk, it isn't just about uh, a, tick a tick box attitude to meeting external requirements. The, the drive, the move to data driven science is a movement all on its own, in which, of course, the requirements of external funders are important, but they're not the main driver. It's about a change. Data driven science is really about a change in the way that research is undertaken and disseminated and how we view it. So, these other issues here about the need to inform researchers and to advocate to researchers and to raise awareness is a really important point, too, in, in creating uh, a research data environment where people are engaged and you can develop your infrastructure and your policies and your practice as you go, as you go forwards. Uh, Jeffrey's talked a lot uh, uh, about open data. Not, uh, as I'm not, I don't really have a lot more. To, uh, I don't really have a lot more to say here. I don't know why I'm being told I need to uh, update the uh, Acrobat reader. Let's forget that. <laughs> okay. Uh, not all data can be open. We talked a lot about open data, but not all data can be open. And the, and the Roadmap does um, uh, recognize that. Um, and here at the bottom of the screen, we give some examples of areas where in the discussions with the Leru, those 21 Leru institutions in the Leru roadmap, these came up as areas where th there wasn't a, a, a level of confidence that data could be made open and freely available. So national security, if you have national security uh, arrangements and you put all those on the web, that possibly isn't the best idea because people will find out how you defend yourself and we'll try and avoid the uh, defensive mechanisms that you put in, you put in place. Uh, there may be data protection issues if you are a patient in a, a cohort study. You may not well want your medical details to be plastered all over the, the web so people can identify you from your, uh, from your medical, uh, uh, your medical uh, uh, record. So I think one of the issues, and again, it would be very, very interesting if this comes up in the discussions in the workshops this afternoon, where it is, if there is a dividing line between where data can be open and where it has to remain closed, wh where is that dividing line? And what do you think the reasons are that makes uh, data uh, have to be closed rather than having a default, default position where data is uh, uh, open? Hello, and now it doesn't want to move. There we go. So, uh, learn, as I say, is about taking the, Le the Leru uh, research data roadmap forward to the next uh, uh, stage. It, it builds on all the issues which the um, roadmap identified and wants to expand them by bringing in more um, um, uh, description about practice and reality in a host of institutions, not simply the 21 Nehru institutions that we surveyed in order to create the, the embryonic uh, uh, roadmap. So the LEARN project is a two-year funded uh, uh, project, and the idea is to build on the roadmap and, and to build answer, a, a, a toolkit that will answer some of those questions about the global, the, you know, Jeffrey's map about the, the geographical uh, infrastructures which together would make a, a global uh, infrastructure for open science. Uh, the aim of LEARN is to start to identify what the key questions are that, that we need to answer to deliver that, and then we won't answer all of them, but we will answer a fair number through the course of these workshops and through the interaction with the people who attend. We, we'll be able to tease out answers to some of the questions that will help make those global, that 
global network sustainable and uh, uh, viable for uh, researchers to, uh, uh, to use. So we, we are five uh, partners, and each of the partners in the LEARN project will be holding uh, a, a workshop. Uh, this is the first, uh, so um, you're, you're our champions, and we will be keeping in touch with you after the workshop is over. You'll become one of the... Um, we're aiming to collect around 500 uh, champions in the five, uh, uh, in the five um, workshops that we hold, say, if we have 100 people attending each workshop. You will become our champions. We'd like to use the network during the course of the project to bounce ideas off you to send draft documents to you, maybe for comment, or if we are unclear on certain issues, ask for your advice on how we might take certain issues forward. So this is the start of a dialogue that we hope we can continue electronically during the next 18 months while we uh, are producing the, um, uh, the outputs of the project. So the other um, workshops will be in Barcelona, in Vienna, uh, LIBA, the Association of European Research Libraries, will be holding one in, in Helsinki, in Finland, as attached to the uh, LIBA conference this year. And then uh, the, the final, well, the, 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 interna the truly international one, I mean, outside Europe, will be held in Santiago in, uh, in uh, uh, Chile. So we will try and build... So what you really want to see is whether there are differences in different parts of Europe and outside Europe in the answers to the questions that we want to uh, consider and then build up a fairly detailed uh, picture of what the uh, solutions might be. Because as, as Geoffrey said, when he was looking at his geographical dispersal of research data infrastructures, it won't be the same answer. It might not be the same answer in every part of the world because different issues will apply in different parts of the world and we may need a different set of answers depending on local circumstances. So it isn't about, it isn't about uh, developing a one-size-fits-all answer, but a set of answers that will work depending on the circumstances in which you, you yourselves are, are working. Uh, and the, the outputs of the project at the end of the three, uh, uh, at the end of the two years will be this model, research data management policy, uh, the toolkit with all the best practice and all the case studies that we're identifying in the breakout groups with you today and in the other uh, workshops. And then an executive briefing for people like David Price uh, and Vice Provost and Rectors to try and engage them in two pages because that's the only... You, we'll have a slot on their radar screen maybe of about five minutes to engage with them before they think, oh, no, this isn't important. I need to go and think about something else. So for an executive briefing, it has to be really targeted with the right questions and the right answers. And those answers have to include something about costs. Otherwise, they'll say, well, they, this is uncosted. They're asking for a blank check. We're not going to do that. So the executive briefing really is going to be the key strategic document to get uh, the issues of research data management uh, at, raised to the highest level in an organization. Uh, so op open science, as Geoffrey said, the open science is a, a revolution in the way that uh, research is done, and it, this is an analysis of the open science debate as um, created, or as, uh, yeah, the, the analysis was created by DG Research, the De Directorate General for Research, as a result of a consultation which they undertook with research organisations in uh, Europe. Uh, they, they looked at the research cycle, which is on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, and the five boxes on the left-hand side of the screen, and then tried to identify what the characteristics of, these, uh, of the research cycle were. And if we were looking at, at where research data sits, it would sit largely, though not exclusively, but largely in those two boxes at the bottom there, the, uh, in the issues about uh, open data and the fact that uh, research now is, is, is data-intensive because so much... Uh, uh, data can be uh, uh, collected. And as part of the consultation, the, director, the DG research asked the uh, uh, contributors, well, do you think there's a need for a policy intervention? Does the commission need to do anything in order to uh, raise awareness about these issues around open science? And so I, I've, do, I've captured just a few here on the left-hand side. There are, the list is a whole lot bigger than this, but I, I, it's, I chose issues about raising awareness for open science, whether uh, traditional metrics are adequate enough to capture the impact and importance of open science, uh, about the development of infrastructures, 
and then looking at open access to publications and uh, to uh, data. And the first column is, the, and the question is, uh, is there a need for policy uh, intervention? Uh, and you'll see here that there wasn't much interest, unfortunately, in any kind of intervention about metrics. Uh, and I suspect that's because researchers on the whole don't like being measured anyway and didn't want anyone to measure them. And if anyone was going to measure them, it certainly wasn't going to be the Commission. So on the right-hand side, should this be an EU... So the, the, the columns on the right-hand side, uh, if there is an intervention, should these be EU interventions? These scored very, very lowly. Four, only 4% 4 thought the EU should intervene and do something about metrics. So, but metrics is an issue. Because if you want to create a, a workforce which gains uh, credit for making their data open and available for sharing, uh, then there should be some career progression. It could be financial. It could be uh, in the, through the structure that you're, 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 you're working in through a series of promotions. But no university, I'm talking about universities now because they're, that's, those are the bodies I know best, no university has a career progression structure like that in place or even really knows uh, how to uh, introduce one. If we're going to introduce one, we're going to, have to, we're, we're going to have to develop metrics that capture how you measure the impact of this uh, work so that in a HR committee you've got some sort of purchase on how you make decisions about who is promoted and who isn't. And if you talk to directors of HR, they want overt, they need overt and uh, transparent metrics so that they can justify decisions that are made about whether somebody is promoted and somebody is not. So this isn't very helpful, the fact that not many people wanted uh, interventions about metrics, because if we don't have it, some sort of intervention about metrics or some development around the metric space, we're not going to be able to develop the... Um, uh, uh, arena where uh, you get career uh, recognition, payment, or, or promotion for, for being an open scientist, for making your data open and available. So that's an area, again, I hope will come out in the discussions in the workshops today and in future workshops about how we might move to that situation. And it may mean looking at the metrics issue first to capture what the metric should be so we can go then and advocate to directors of HR that this is actually a, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, the area where people most wanted uh, policy intervention actually was in the area of OA uh, to publications and data. So 63% of those questions said, yes, there does need to be some uh, uh, policy intervention. And there was a reasonable number who thought it should be the EU doing the intervention, of, so about 26%, which is, for the EU columns, quite a high, quite a high percentage. Okay, so those are, that's the background to learn. That's where I think learn uh, fits into the landscape and what we hope to achieve in the two years the project will run and how you're absolutely essential, your input is absolutely essential to enable us uh, to deliver on the objectives of the project. L let me talk uh, in the last part of the presentation about three, ju just three areas that I've... Um, uh, selected as being of interest to me, which aren't necessarily covered in the original LARU roadmap, but which I hope we can cover if there's sufficient interest in uh, the Learn uh, Toolkit once we produce the uh, toolkit. So the first one is, as I say, the result of a, uh, a discussion that I and a number of other invited uh, uh, visitors, including uh, uh, Professor Leonelli, had in Bern, in, in Switzerland, at the end of uh, last year, where the Swiss funding agency invited us to come over for a day to try and advise them what they, as a research funder, should be doing in the research data space. So what we did in UCL, what, I, uh, what my colleagues did in UCL uh, to prepare me for this visit was to track 15 global funder uh, policies. And I, I list here. They're, they're on the UCL research data management websites, so they're freely available. We, we track these are mainly, not entirely, but mainly uh, UK funders. And then uh, uh, Miriam uh, tracked what the um, overview, uh, um, created an overview of the expectations of the research funder in terms of research data management. Uh, so why did we do this? Because uh, in the uh, area of open access to publications, it is research funders that have set the tone and the pace of uh, uh, development 
Uh, and certainly in the UK, with the Wellcome Trust's very proactive policy and the RCUK policy on a preference for gold open access, that has really led the discussions about open access to publications, which have been underlined by this race to open access in REF 2020, our next research evaluation framework, where there, where there is an open access uh, requirement now to be uh, as a condition for uh, submitting a paper to that evaluation framework. So if research funders can set the pace in uh, open access to publications, they could potentially certainly do the same in terms of research data management by making uh, explicit various requirements of the researcher as a condition of being uh, funded. So what Miriam did uh, was to track what the current level of expectations uh, is for these 15, 15 uh, funder, uh, uh, research funders uh, whose policies that she uh, uh, looked at. Have I changed that? Yes, I have. So what, what were my, recommend, my personal recommendations are to the Swiss uh, National Funder based on our analysis of these policies? Well, here they are on the, on the left-hand side. They should require research data management policies in the home institution of the researcher. Uh, they should require data management plans from individual researchers. Uh, they should be, or they could, maybe not should, may, maybe it's could, they could require that the default position for research data produced through their funding is that it's open, unless there are very good reasons why it can't be. And they could fund infrastructure, just as uh, the UK Data Archive here in the UK is funded by one of the uh, research, or money coming through the research councils. Research funders can fund infrastructure as well as research projects. Uh, and it may be that that is an increasingly important role for research funders in this space, if as we believe, but don't yet absolutely know, uh, the costs of running these systems uh, and processes is so great that there may need to be communal uh, funding. So research funders do potentially have a really important role to play in funding, as well as encouraging new uh, 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 research. So that's the possible position a research funder might take in the research data management space, and I'd be interested to hear what your views are when you're talking about this uh, in your workshops this afternoon. Uh, the second area I'd like briefly to talk about is about text and data mining and uh, uh, the Hague Declaration. So one of the tools uh, that uh, is essential in uh, a research data space is the ability to text and data mine using automated tools which will search and find meaning and synergies and parallels in a host of uh, publications and uh, research data which would be impossible to do uh, manually. The amount of material is simply too great. You'd spend all your time reading. You'd spend no time doing drawing conclusions or doing uh, uh, analysis because you'd be, you'd be too busy actually trying to understand what the... What the data or the publication means in the first place. So what, of course, one of the answers to that is to uh, do all the text extraction al automatically uh, and then to work on the uh, results of the, of, of the extraction. And so Lieber was, uh, in, has been influential and led the charge for uh, the publication of the Hague Declaration, which aims to form a framework for how we understand uh, access to knowledge and information and facts in uh, a digital uh, age. And when uh, the Hague Declaration uh, was published, uh, the, the, the important point that the Declaration makes is that brute facts, raw data, research data was never meant to be covered by uh, a, a copyright regime which restricts access. You can't restrict, you shouldn't be able to restrict access to the, to the truth because that is not an academic friendly regime in which to work. But that where there was a danger that uh, research data could be covered by copyright restrictions, there you should argue in your national or international jurisdiction for uh, some sort of exemption or exception to uh, uh, any kind of legal restraint on text and data mining. And this is what uh, a number of uh, European uh, bodies have been doing. We have been at LIBA and LERU, the League of European Research Universities, are arguing uh, positively uh, with the Commission for a, an exception 
for text and data mining in the forthcoming uh, reform of EU copyright frameworks. The UK is unusual because we do have an exception. In our national legislation, the Hargreaves Review of the UK uh, legislation did allow, uh, does allow, uh, an exception for text and data mining for academic purposes. But no other European country has any kind of exception like this in their national uh, legislation. And that makes international collaborations and collaborations across national borders impossible because you cannot do the same type of work in every uh, member state because the law doesn't uh, allow it. So the way to bring a harmonized legal environment in, into being and to give the researcher a level of confidence that text and data mining is uh, possible is to uh, argue for uh, an exception for text and data mining in EU copyright framework. In December, the Commission issued a communication saying that they were minded to introduce such an exception in the new year, so in, in 2016, uh, and they will be bringing forth proposals in the next few uh, months. Um, it would be mandatory, so what Leroux, is, uh, Leroux and Lieber are arguing for, that this should be a mandatory exception. It cannot be overridden by contracts or by technical prevention measures, uh, and it would provide, uh, if, if, if passed into European... Uh, law, it would provide the legal certainty that researchers need in order to undertake uh, text and data mining to engage in uh, this, data this move to data-driven uh, uh, science. What are the benefits of doing this? Well, there are a whole lot of benefits that are listed in the, uh, the, the Hague Declaration. It would allow us, with uh, an increased level of assurance to address grand challenges, that uh, confront society where we currently have uh, a level of doubt about whether we can perform text data mining, so in areas such as climate change and global ep epidemics. If we had the legal certainty that we're looking for, this would make research into these areas much easier to uh, uh, perform. Okay, my, my last example is about uh, the European Open Science Cloud. And it, again, I'm going to refer back to Jeffrey's uh, slide of his... Um, of his iceberg, with uh, most of it underwater and a bit of it on, on, uh, above the surface. And he divided it very usefully into, into a, a number of different uh, uh, categories. So the European Open Science Cloud, uh, the high-level expert group, was set up by the Commission uh, to try and scope what the nature of this, uh, any European, a collaborative European venture like an Open Science Cloud uh, would uh, uh, look like. Uh, and as Geoffrey um, illustrated in his uh, slides, it would be the European uh, component of a, of, a, of a global cloud, actually, uh, with, a, with a number of instantiations in, 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 the, different, uh, in the different continents. Uh, we have written our report. I, I'm not allowed to tell you what it says, because I'm afraid it is under embargo. So uh, I can't tell you what the recommendations are, but you might be interested to know that uh, the issues that I've listed here... Uh, at the bottom of the screen and with the bullet points, you may well find addressed in the, in, in the report, though I couldn't guarantee it. So we, the report might well say something about infrastructures and how infrastructures uh, sit together. It might well talk about skills development and try and define what a data scientist is and whether this phrase, data scientist... We had a very long discussion about the phrase data scientist... And I can't tell you what the result is, because you'd have to read the report. But that we, we, we are conscious that there is a, there is a need to redefine skills and uh, uh, roles. I talked already about reward and recognition, the fact that in, certainly in the universities, there are practically no arrangements for <laughs> progression and recognition for being an open scientist, which is uh, hopeless if you're going to move to an open science uh, agenda. Uh, we talk about governance and, and standards, uh, who's going to manage all these um, um, uh, collaborative clouds, how are we going to get agreement over which standards to use, how is it all going to fit together, how do we stop people going off and doing their own thing so that they're not interoperable with everybody else in the, in the cloud, so we, we, may, we may possibly make some recommendations about, about that as well. Uh, and funding, is, there, will be some, there, are, there, will, there will probably be something about funding in the report as well. So this is report is being launched at the Open Science Conference in Amsterdam in uh, April, and I hope we'll, well, we believe we'll form the basis for future 
work to make this cloud uh, a, a reality. So the, although we only had an initial <coughs> lifespan of six months, we have been asked to stay on for another 18 months, actually, to help advise in the implementation phase once the, if, as we hope it will be, the report is uh, accepted. So let's get to the final slide. What, what, what do I conclude from all this? That, well, research data management has many stakeholders and that uh, a data-driven, uh, an approach which sees uh, uh, a data-driven uh, research um, framework as the way forward will change the way that researchers um, undertake research and the way their research is shared and uh, disseminated. And the challenge for LEARN is to provide parts of the infrastructure that will feed that change. And in particular, these three uh, elements, the model research data management policy, uh, the exemplar on case studies and best practice in the toolkit that we'll provide, and then the executive high level executive briefings for decision makers where we try and perform the advocacy role that is part of LEARN to get institutions and learned societies and research funders uh, involved, actively involved in, in discussing and deciding what their role is in the research data management space. So if you have been, thank you for listening, uh, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. So any, don't be shy, any questions or comments, especially if you disagree, that would be fantastic. Oh, Susan Riley must have a question, yes. I'm sorry. Sorry, Paul. Absolutely fine. <laughs> um, yeah, Susan Riley, Libra, the Association of European Research Libraries. Just, um, Jeffrey got me thinking, I guess. He made a, 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 a good point that the European Commission's view on open science is very much targeted at researchers and targeted at maybe the creation of an elite. And since you're really involved in a lot of this, uh, advising the Commission on this yeah. and universities. I was wondering what your thought, thoughts are about opening up open science to other stakeholders, whether it be um, industry or um, citizens. Yes. Yeah, general public. Okay. Well, again, I, I can't tell you what the, what the report uh, uh, says, but I think you will find that it does address both those issues about opening up to private, public-private partnerships and to um, uh, citizen science. Let, let me say a little bit about citizen uh, uh, science. So there is a, a Leru is, is very involved in the citizen, spy, uh, citizen science space, and, and uh, 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 Dan Weiler, who is vice, who's vice provost for research in the University of Zurich, is leading a piece of work very similar to the LEARN uh, work, except he hasn't yet got European uh, funding, where he's trying to um, develop a charter and a framework for uh, citizen science and how citizen scientists can engage in the, the open science uh, space. So I was at a, one of his workshop in uh, Zurich, again in uh, uh, November, and we have a draft uh, document which we're considering how to take forward as a declaration of the role and importance of uh, citizen science. I think in the new year, Leru will be considering it, other bodies will be considering it as well. So I would expect to see some um, more European visibility for that document and that statement uh, later this year. I, I don't think, uh, I, I can see that uh, the initial perception of the Commission's view is that the European Open Science Cloud may be geared towards traditional researchers. I, I can hope, reassure you without revealing what we say that, that in the report that won't be the case. Lady here. Uh, hello, Paul. Muriel Zweighuis, Regensburg Cosmos College. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, we, well, my colleagues and I are here to represent the Arts, Humanities and Social Science cohort. I know, you're here in yes, numbers. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I, I know that we are discussing science in its broader sense, that is the creation of knowledge, any kind of knowledge. Yes. But I do know that also, and, and I'm sure you agree, because I think you're in the history of my background, I try uh, to be, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, that some people get a little bit uneasy when we talk about text mining, particularly when we're talking about creative outputs, yes. uh, as we produce rather a large number of them in our institution. Indeed. 
And, uh, and I was wondering whether perhaps you could say something about how uh, managing data in the arts and humanities may have its uh, specific requirements that may differ slightly from some of what is happening in sciences where perhaps text and data mining are more appropriate and where perhaps the copyright implications are slightly different. Okay, that's a really interesting question. I'm very glad you've, you've, you've raised it. And let me say straight away, I have no idea what the answer is. Uh, <laughs> I am a, I'm a traditional historian in the sense that I look at um, uh, 15th century and 16th century texts happily out of copyrights. I don't have to worry about copyright uh, restrictions. One of the things we'd like to do in the workshops, and in your workshop this afternoon, please, if it, if it isn't raised, I think there is one of the exem exemplar questions we've put uh, on the list for our uh, workshop leaders is to talk about text and data mining. If it's not raised, please, please do raise it, because we would like to know what your view is about uh, text and data mining and uh, research data curation in the creative art spaces where many of us, including me, don't have uh, substantial expertise. I mean, what are the initial concerns, do you think? Uh, I think a lot of our colleagues who produce creative output see this as being part of their um, uh, creative endeavors that are practice based that they probably would not wish to be mined um, I suppose right. or or for that matter exploited commercially necessarily because it is also to them a form of income right uh, and because we do have a lot of staff who are perhaps on fractional contracts right. not hundred percent research so that's one thing uh, we also do often use within our texts uh, materials that are not necessarily produced by our scholars ourselves but that we do write about. Uh, in the creative output, so we right. may not necessarily want those that information copied because it isn't necessarily w something that we have produced ourselves, but where we have gained explicit permission from that person in order to produce it just the once in the book. Sure. So you know, oh, these are all the sorts of things that we would need sure. to think about in terms of our data because it is data. You know, it's absolutely, creative output. No, yes, no, no, so. absolutely. <laughs> So well, these are well, just one or two. I've got a couple. Of my, I'm a copyright officer. I'm not, ah. I'm not a copyright lawyer. I've got a couple of immediate reactions just to start the conversation going. One is it would be, I wouldn't recommend this because I'm an enthusiast for open science, but you could make that data close if you were really concerned about losing control or losing or, or opening up to exploitation. Though that wouldn't be my recommendation. I think my recommendation initially would be to look at the licensing that you apply to the, the, the data outputs that, so that, that would control the levels of access and reuse. So that uh, if you could define in, in, a, in a series of um, uh, categories what types of data we're talking about, we could then look at the, maybe, for example, the Creative Commons suite of licenses and see how that would um, provide the level of protection you feel you need in order to make the, as much data as possible open. That would be my starting point anyway. Yes, and that would be very helpful. And I think if funders and other people could be made aware of this sort of thing, then that would be great. Where, you know, where it's just CC buying everything, perhaps is not appropriate for people like ourselves. No, indeed. And my arts and humanities <laughs> researchers, uh, when uh, we, I talk to them about Creative Commons in our publications board, in the UCL Press board, which is an open access press, arts and humanities people don't like CC by and won't, won't use it. So in our UCL Press, for example, although the default license for our published outputs is CC by, we do let authors choose more restrictive licenses if they feel they want to. And arts and humanities scholars usually do. So maybe the licensing route would be the, no, looking at uh, assigning a, the, the right Creative Commons license would be the way to deal with your concerns. And that would be great if we could get that in the toolkit yes, at the I end of so. the project. Yeah, because yeah. I always feel that our researchers feel a little bit. Uh, uh, not included, shall we say. Oh, when no. These things are not specifically mentioned in policies or wherever they say, oh, well, it doesn't apply to me. So well, when, uh, the, um, uh, when, when Open Science was called Science 2.0, and it, we were in consultation phase, I pointed out to Jean-Claude Gorgelman, who is the DG research um, officer who, who, who led the consultation, that in English, open science didn't mean what he wanted it to mean, because it meant a restriction of the cover, a science in English. English means actually a restriction of the coverage of the, of, of the th uh, thematic areas that you're covering, and would exclude arts humanities and, op uh, arts, arts, humanities and social sciences, because researchers wouldn't, would say, that's an issue for science then, medics. It's not an issue for us. On the continent of Europe, science means something different. So there are, immediately we have this terminology problem, and getting the message across, if you're using the phrase open science, is that in England and the UK is actually more, more difficult as a result. Yes, thank you. Okay.
Oh, Jeffrey's going to come back at me. That's brilliant. Excellent. Uh, Paul, you had this nice slide showing uh, exceptions to openness, which I think were national security. Yes, let uh, me see if I can get that up on commercial the interests screen. And, 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 um, uh, and personal privacy. Yeah. Um, I think the more you think about each one of those, what seems to begin with as an obvious boundary, yeah. it just evaporates. Okay. And we've actually had a fourth one, and the fourth one would be if the originator doesn't like it, <laughs> which I think is a bit dodgy, personally. And I, I, and I mean, I think all of those can be really questioned okay. really hard. Fine. Uh, and, and should be. Um, and data protection is an interesting one, because if you look across Europe, and there's been quite a lot of studies of this, then what you see is that a cultural response is very different in some countries than in others. Yeah. And this is one of the points where the Commission finds life very difficult because you know, their, 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 their competence lies in competition policy. And, and effectively, the way they've used that is to say, well, actually, everything relates to competition policy, and therefore, we're competent at everything. And I just want in personal, personal privacy, for instance, is an interesting one, where you go from country to country, and the perspective is quite, quite different. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that the, that's one of the domains I would want to all those three three issues okay. really really have a go at okay. hard. So. Well, um, clearly we must come and talk to you some more about those particular issues, and we're really happy to do that as part of the project. Th th there will be no problem about uh, pulling back from these areas and saying, well, actually they're not on further reflection areas where data has to be closed. Even just because the Lerner roadmap originally said that they were, it doesn't mean that on further reflection or with further discussion that couldn't that could that couldn't change that's the whole point about having you know, the next phase of the project is is to develop the findings of the Leru roadmap okay i'm afraid we are going to have to close if if, if there are, i think i saw one or two more hands do come and grab me at lunchtime and you can uh, uh, be ha be happy to discuss uh, the the points that you wanted to raise